welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Well, let's do this. Um, let's, I need God, you need God, so let's go before the Lord in prayer and, and let's just ask God to bless this time. And so I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. And uh, thank you, sir. And uh, let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you. In the name of Jesus, we're just grateful we get to be part of a healthy, strong church that's reaching their area for Jesus and the world. God, we're so grateful that uh, you allow us this privilege. Lord, today we have come to hear from the Spirit of the Lord. We need to grow. We need to be healthy. We need to be strong. We need, Father, to do what you would have us to do and have the courage to do what you would have us to do. God, we'll give you the praise and glory and the honor. We just lift up this day to you and ask that you would speak to us, ask that you would bless us this day with your word. Father, I would ask that you would bless all the churches of the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are hearing and preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our pastors and, uh, that are preaching. Bless those men of God, women of God all over the world. Bless our Baptist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters and we thank you, God, for our Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters, Lutherans and Methodist, Episcopalian, Charismatics and Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, that you bless these churches all over the Inland Empire as well as around the world. They're our brothers and our sisters. Lord, we never at any time think of ourselves as better than them. But we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together, in one field building one kingdom, not a man's, no, no, sir, but yours, your kingdom. Be glorified in your houses everywhere and especially here, and God will give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. As the word of the Lord becomes alive to us today, we give you the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say Amen. God is so good. Take your seat. Go with me to Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse number eight. For those of you that may not know this, we go line upon line, precept upon precept. God wrote it that way, and the word of the Lord is the handbook, the manual on how to live life. And I want you to hear what I'm about to say to you because you can have a snapshot picture of God there's a lot of places you can get a snapshot picture of God or you can get to know who God is. There's a big difference between taking a picture of me and understanding basically what I look like than sitting down with me and spending a lot of time with me. And that's what the Word of God does is it causes you to get into the very heart of God to understand His character, nature, and attributes. So you hear the Word of God, which is a snapshot, and then you spend time with God, which develops the image and the heart of God that will direct you in being all that God has called you to be. God has a plan for your life. There is a purpose of why you are on the planet. It is all found within the perimeter of this book designed by God so that you might live the life that God would have you to live be a witness to a lost and dying world out there that needs to know about Jesus Christ, even though they don't even want to know. They need to know that Jesus is alive and well and doing well, and they need him. And you're the mouthpiece for God. You're the distributor of his goodness upon the planet. You're the West Coast distributor of God's goodness. Therefore, if you don't know how to distribute, what to distribute, how to act, what to act like, you will be constantly defeated and destroyed so you don't do anything except exist as a Christian instead of producing as a Christian. So God wants you to understand the importance of the word of the Lord. As we look at God's word today, I'm gonna just share with you this verse is without a doubt one of my favorite verses in the scripture. I say that a lot because I'm in love with so many of them. But this one is really a highlight of my life. This one says so much about you and so much about me that helps us to grow to a great place of maturity. 
I want to read the verse. I want to explain the verse. Then I'll give you the title to the verse. And then we'll move on from there. Is that okay? I want you to go with me to Hebrews 5th chapter, verse number 8. 5th chapter, verse number 8 says, Though he was the Son, speaking of Jesus Christ, he was the Son, yet he learned obedience by the things in which he suffered. He learned obedience by the things in which he suffered. To me, that's a bizarre statement that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who puts it all together, by the power of his might, holds the oceans in its right place so they don't flood the land, holds the moon and stars in its right place, speaks and solar systems exist, knows the intricate as well as the maximum, understands things that science hasn't even found yet. And here is God, who knows it all, doesn't know something, and had to learn something. And what he had to learn is what you and I have to learn. We have to learn from God how to be obedient to the things of the Lord. You see, even though he was the creator of all mankind, the creator of the heavens and of the earth, he had never been the one in the flesh before. He created mankind but wasn't man himself. He didn't know the frailties of men, didn't know the factions inside of man, doesn't, didn't understand the fears and the feelings that go with mankind. And in the midst of that, in order to be obedient, something taught him. The word suffers and interesting word. The word suffer means the word adversary, adversity, pressure, trial, anything contrary to situations in life. Adversity when it comes puts pressure on us and every single one of us will experience adversity in our lives. Like Jesus it will either teach us something, our adversity will destroy us. And all of that has to do with how you handle the problems, adversity that comes into your life. You will either grow or be defeated. Or you will be in such a place that you have to keep trying it over and over and over again, going through the same trials, the same pressure, over and over again, until you finally get it, what you need to learn. The title of the message is A Teacher Named Adversity. It'll either teach us or destroy us. And that's your call, every one of us that are in here. It's amazing to me how something that puts pressure on us, something that we don't like, something that was seemingly bad, something that is adverse to what we think can bring something good in our life. It doesn't make a lot of sense. You would think good would produce good, but here we find that sometimes these adversities in life produce something good in our life. For an example, what more could there be as an adverse situation than one going to the cross, a beaten bloody mess, nailed to the cross, dying on that cross. And from that cross that is so horrific and so horrible comes life. That doesn't make sense. Stop and think about it for a moment. As God speaks, he says, a seed must go into the ground. And it doesn't produce. It's got to first die and then it produces an adverse situation, death. Then it produces life. You and I go before the Lord and we die to ourselves and then it produces the life of God. It's almost an amazing situation, but life is full of things that are adverse that come against us, but yet through it all we stand and we keep on going in life. It's like a muscle. Did you know that when you're exercising a muscle and you're making it bigger, it's because you're first breaking it down in order to make it bigger. So down becomes up. 
in the things of God. When I was a young boy, I was in school, and in the 50s, I had a lot of people in our classrooms that were, if, you, if I may use the word, handicapped, but the word was really, they were physically, weren't challenged, they were physically lame. They had crutches. A lot of my friends had crutches when they went around. Polio had been a very big problem. And I remember as a little boy lining up in school, third grade, petrified about getting a shot. We were all going to get our polio shot. And then when I found out they actually put polio in you to resist the polio that you might get, that even scared me more. But inside the shot was a vaccine of a little dose of polio so that your immune system could get strong and fight off that which wanted to come. And over 90% of the people never had any problems whatsoever with the area of polio. It literally eliminated the problem. Smallpox was the same thing. Many of you have a little scar on your arm somewhere because somebody shot a little smallpox inside of you and that horrible adverse thing now becomes something that brings forth good. But we have a life all the time as Christians and we have adverse situations coming towards us and we bellyache to God and we bawl and squall and we complain to God. We raise our hands and we curse at God. Where are you, God? What are you doing, God? Where have you left me, God? How come this is happening to me? You could have stopped this, God. And we don't realize that in adverse situations, God wants to bring something glorious out of it. He wants to take us to a new place with him, deeper, meaningful relationship, being a greater witness to a lost and dying world. And oftentimes we miss adversity being our teacher and we see adversity as something horrible in our lives. I remember that the love of God is in this church, and I love you so much. But I'll never forget the season that I went through starting a church called Los Angeles Christian Fellowship, a couple of churches before we started this one. We were in Los Angeles for three to four months. Every single sun, Saturday night, we, would, we lived in Redlands, and we would drive to West Los Angeles, and we were starting a church there. And every night in the city of Westwood, we, Debbie and I were in our 30s, and we would pass out invitations. We were just young kids that say, come to church. We were meeting at the YWCA and having church. We were starting this church, and no one showed up for four months. Did you know that God spoke to me every single week and said, preach to the empty seats? I said, God, no one's here. They're empty. One day my mother showed up and my father showed up. They were the only ones. They sat there and they looked at me. My mother with her red hair and her red face got all red and she started crying. She thought her son had lost her mind because I was preaching like there were thousands in the place. And out of, let me tell you something, out, out of that adverse time, we would drive back to Redlands weeping before God saying, God, why? That doesn't make sense. We're preaching the gospel. We didn't understand God. I don't understand any of this. Why isn't somebody showing up? Why isn't there somebody there? Why isn't there somebody faithful? God, I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus. Don't you want me to do that, Lord? And out of that was birth a love for you. Every time you pull into this parking lot and I see you, I go, oh my God, someone's coming, God. I'm so grateful for them. I love them so much, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Out of the adverse situation, I fell in love with you and wanted everybody nobody wanted. I just said, you say, how come there's so many people in your church? I say, God, because I prayed a prayer. God, give me everybody nobody wants. And here you are. <laughs> and I love you. Adversity can be your teacher or it can be the greatest hindrance to your walk depending upon how you deal with it. It's so important. You got to remember some things, and I think they're important for us. In John, the 15th chapter, verse number two says these words. Let me pop it up on the overhead for you. Every branch that is in me does not bear fruit. He takes it away. I understand that. You don't produce, you get thrown out. That's the kingdom of God. 
Now watch this, in every branch that bears fruit, I would think he exalts, he loves, he brings in closer, he makes more wonderful, he gives great things to his all. Surely it's going to say every branch that does produce, guess what, he will bless, he says he prunes. Every branch that produces, he prunes. Pruning is not an easy thing, it's a hard thing, it's an adverse thing. It's a suffering time. It's a time of discouragement and, 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 and unfulfillment. It's a time of questioning, pruning, that he may bear more fruit. So important for us to see. Keep in mind, here's a verse you ought to memorize every day of your life. You ought to say it about yourself and over yourself on every situation of your life. Romans 8, 28. It says we ought to know these things. That... All things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and for those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for the good. In other words, God takes every bad thing and he'll turn it around for good. Let me give you an illustration of real catastrophic, horror, horrific experience. You want to hear one? That was horrible this week in Connecticut. Here's a real one. Six million Jews annihilated in Germany. Starved to death, innocent people thrown into the gas chambers and buried in mass graves. Six million of them, every single one of them had a heart for things that they had for the future. Every one had a dream and a vision. The little girls wanted to know what man they were wondering all their life who was going to be their husband. Those men had dreams of going someplace only to be gathered up and dumped into a mass grave can I tell you something? Out of that horrific experience comes Israel today. America needs to know we ought to always back the people of God in every situation. Is anybody listening? All things work together for the good of them that love the Lord are called according to his purpose. You need to know the limits of God's pressure that he'll allow in your life. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse number 13, listen to what it says. No temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man. You may think you're alone. You may see your problems as exclusive. God doesn't care about you. There is only you in the problem. Nobody else has ever had a bad situation like yours. You're the only one on earth that is failing. You're the only one that has this kind of problem. I want you to know something. God says it is common to man, but God is faithful. I love those words. Who will not allow you, listen to these words, who will not allow you to be tempted, in other words, pressured, or if you will, to be in a place of... Um, uh, 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 adversity, listen, it's beyond that which you are able, the last part of that, but with the adversity will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God is so wonderful. He knows what he's doing, but oftentimes we forget he's in control when adversity hits our house, and we need to be smart. There's a lot of things adversity can teach you. I can stay, say with you, well, this is part number one of a four-part series. Adversity will teach you the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, meekness. But I'm not going to do that. God gave me some things that you need to see today. And I need to see about what adversity will teach us. Is that okay? First thing of what adversity teaches is obedience. We see it with Jesus. When I use the word obedience, a lot of times people don't understand what it incorporates. Let's talk about it just for a moment. It means to obey what God has said. In order to obey what God has said, there will be a choice you must make in order to be obedient. So the word obedient is coupled together always with a choice. I can do it or I can choose not to do it. There'll be a choice. In other words, there will always be along with the word obedient a choice or a test that says where you're really at with God. And the word obedient is usually coupled together with some form of test that's going to prove where you're really 
at with God because you make the right choices because adversity causes you to be obedient, making the right choices. I can't make the right choices unless I am obedient, so I'm going to have to pass the test. There's this Bible story I want to take you to in Genesis. If you go there with me, I want to describe a story with you, if I may, of Abraham. Genesis 22. Abraham, and let me explain who he is so that we're all on the same page and then I'll read you some verses. In order for Abraham to be Abraham, he had to pass some tests. He's the father of faith. Now listen to what I'm gonna say to you. He is the first Hebrew believer. He is not the first Jew. Judah had not even been in existence yet. He is the first Hebrew believer. And now, in order to be a believer that he needs to be, some things are going to have to come into his life. God blesses him with a son. He's 100 years old. His son, his name is Isaac. He'd been waiting 100 years for an heir. It was very important that he leave what he has to the next generation, not just to his slavery, not to those that served him and manservants, but to those that are of his family and his blood. He had never had his own son. Isaac is born at the age he is 100 years old, Abraham is, and you can imagine what it was like, this child of the promise, that Abraham walked with him, was proud of him, held his hand as they walked together, he was the son of Abraham and Sarah. They probably played together. They loved each other and cared about each other. You can imagine if you're a parent what it must be like to really not have something and then have something is like amazing feeling. It's like you're just so overwhelmed with love and appreciation and gratefulness. Then God speaks to Abraham. God says to Abraham, Abraham, I have seen how you are and I want you to take your son, your only begotten son, to the top of the mountain and there I want you to offer him up as a burnt sacrifice to me. Oh my God, you gotta be kidding. Was that you, Lord? Or is that the devil speaking to me? I'm in love with, can you imagine what went through Abraham's heart? I'm in love with my boy. I love the way he laughs. I love the way he looks. I love the way he walks. I love the way he talks. I love the way he comes and holds me. I love the way he's near me. I love his feelings. I love his breath. I hear his little heart beating. I know this, and now you want to offer. Now, here's what a burnt offering is, and a lot of you don't know that. A burnt offering is first tied up and it is slayed with a knife. Once it's slayed with a knife, tied up, it's thrown on a kindling of fire, and it's burned to ashes. The purpose of a burnt offering is that you're offering it to God. It's not worth anything anymore because it's nothing but ashes, and the ashes are gone, and they represent you're giving up whatever you have completely for the things of God, and it's a sacrifice unto the Lord. It's a horrible experience. The Bible says his boy, Isaac, marched up the mountain carrying the, the sticks to make the fire. He was old enough to walk and carry the sticks. He gets to the top, he looks at his dad, and he says, Dad, he says, I see the sticks for the fire. I see the knife for the slain, but I don't see the offering. Where's the offering as a burnt offering? Then his dad, can you imagine the feeling, takes this boy and starts to wrap him up and tie him up. The boy is old enough to know that he is the burnt offering. Oh my God, can you imagine the tears? Can you imagine the feeling? Can you imagine what it's like? Abraham didn't know what you know. What you know is the God that we serve does not accept human sacrifice. But Abraham at the time didn't know that. You know our God doesn't accept human sacrifice, but he didn't know it. And all of a sudden he starts to raise the knife because he's going to carry through with the word of God and be obedient to God. Let me tell you something, my friends. 
And then a voice comes and says, Abraham, Abraham, stop. He calls out twice, stop. And here's what the word of the Lord said. I want to take you to the 22nd chapter of Genesis. In Genesis 22, starting in verse 15, then the angel of the Lord called on to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply you. Your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand in which you're on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemy. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Don't tell me that during this particular thing that you will see that uh, uh, adversity coming against him, the pressures of life coming against him, trying to stop him from making the decision for God. I'm here to tell you, you will have adversity coming against you to keep you from being obedient to the things of God. The question is whether you will make the right choice and be obedient in the midst of adversity or whether you will give in and do things that you need to do to eliminate the adversity. God eliminates the adversity. You don't need to worry about it. You need to be obedient constantly. Somebody ought to say amen. We're talking about, listen to this, we're talking about what adversity teaches us. Second thing, is courage. Adversity teaches courage. Courage. Without courage, you will never make the right choices, which are God choices. Without courage, in the midst of a diver adversity, you will try to run from the adversity. You'll try to get relief from the adversity. When, in fact, adversity is calling you to make a stand, encourage and make the right choice. You see, it's courageous people who walk in faith. It's courageous people who do what God says. It's courageous to do something you don't see, but you know it's God. And it's courageous when you follow the Lord. Are you following me? You will never make a, a decision for the Lord until you can clearly see without a, any obstruction, clearly see what it is that God would have for you. It's in the time when you're courageous that you do God's word that you clearly see the future. There's this guy by the name of Joseph. If there's ever anybody in the Bible that had reasons to give up on life, it was Joseph. He had 10 brothers and they were stinkers. By the way, those brothers become the children of Israel, the leaders of the tribes of Israel. But his brothers were not good men. They didn't like young Joseph. Joseph was from a different mother. And they didn't like Joseph. Joseph tried to get along with his older brothers, but he couldn't do it. The father favored Joseph because the father loved Joseph's mother so much and she died giving birth to his brother Benjamin. Joseph couldn't be responsible for that, but the brothers hated him. Joseph gets this dream, a crazy dream. He says, the dream in the dream, all of my brothers, including my father, bowed down before me. And he tells his brothers, I had this dream about the future and you're gonna all bow down before me. The brothers go nuts. The arrogant little punk, they're thinking to themselves. They take him out and they beat him up and throw him down in a well. They take his coat and they throw blood all over it, goat's coat, and take it back to Jacob the father and say that a lion ate him while he was out there. They really drag him out of the well and sell him off to slavery. This young boy is going into a caravan that's on its way to Egypt. He becomes a slave in Egypt from a family where his father loved him, where he had warmth and dreams and hopes and goals. Now he's, you talk about adversity, he is now in slavery in Egypt. Can you imagine what a slave was treated like? 
Then he's confronted with a situation and it took courage for him to stand for God. In the midst of his adversity, he's confronted with a situation and he now has to take courage to stand for God. I don't know if you got that, but that's what's going to happen to you. In the midst of adversity, you're going to have to have courage to stand for God. Because in the midst of adversity, instead of having courage, you want to just get out of the problem. And he's now confronted with Potiphar, his boss's wife, who wants to have sex with him. And he says, I will not defile my God, my relationship with God. She lies about him. And now he goes from a slave to a prisoner. Years and years in an Egyptian prison. This young man now is now in an Egyptian prison. Can you imagine what an Egyptian prison was like thousands of years ago? Do you think they had running water? Do you think they had toilet facilities like they have now? Do you think they could have a weight room where they can build their muscles up? Time in the yard, a regular eating routine with food that's on their plate. What do you think it was like? The pins and the holding tanks and the prison cells were caves that were in the ground. They were full of poop and, and people that were dead, mice and rats running all over the place year after year after year. This man has the courage to hold his integrity with God in the midst of adversity. And then there comes a time when he can get out and God delivers him. Listen to this. From the prison to the palace in one day, God can take you, listen to this, your adversity, wherever you're at, as deep as you're in, as bad as it is, he can take you from the prison to the palace in one day if you will stand in courage before God. Is anybody listening? Let me read to you, if I may, out of Genesis, the 45th chapter and verse Number five, he's confronted. Here's what happens as I start to read this to you. His brothers, there's a famine in the land. He's now in the palace. He's now ahead of the Pharaoh's kingdom. He now designs an economic system that brings great wealth to Pharaoh. There's a famine in the land. The word famine means starvation. There's no food. Everybody's starving, and in order for them to live, they got to go to Pharaoh and give all their gold to Pharaoh so Pharaoh gets richer and richer and richer because Pharaoh has the food. Are you following me? And the one that's ahead of it, his name is who? Joseph. Now watch this. So it goes to Canaan land, the starvation. Canaan land is where his brothers are. Hello, do you remember the dirty rats that sold him off into slavery and beat him up and got rid of him and didn't give a flip about him at all? The dirty rats now are hungry. They have no idea that Joseph is in charge of the food of Egypt. They start to go to Egypt to get the food. Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize Joseph. And they are now treated by Joseph. Joseph has to find out about whether his young brother has been mistreated and he's still alive. He finds out whether the father is still alive. After all, they didn't mistreat him. And when he finds out, he finally realizes something. When Joseph took the courage to forgive his brothers, let me say this again. I would have beat the crap out of them. I would have starved them to death. I would have tortured them. Do you remember what you did with me? Do you remember how you threw me into the lion pit? Do you remember how, I, oh, slap those guys. They don't need to just beat the snot out of them. I'm gonna get even. And you would too, so don't give me the baloney. They're sitting there all righteous and be like Joseph. I know exactly how you would do it. But it takes courage to to do the word of God. And when you have courage to do the word of God, you now, listen to me, can see clearly the future that God has. So in the midst of his, uh, 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 this situation that is angered situation, an ugly situation, an adversarial situation, adversity is upon him and pressures are on him, he now forgives his brother and his same breath that he forgives his brother, he sees that what the whole plan was all about. 
It took courage to forgive his brother to see the plan that's ahead of him. Most Christians never see the plan that's ahead of them because they never have the courage to do the word of God. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. Listen to the words again. I'll read it to you. Genesis 45, starting in verse number 4. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. They have no idea who he is. And so they came near, and then they said, I am Joseph, your brother. Can you imagine how they freaked out? I can only imagine them saying, it wasn't me, it was Simeon that hit you that time. I really didn't want that to happen. And they didn't know what to say. They were like blown away. Their mouths are open. And, and Joseph recognizes this, and he says these words, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me to Egypt. Watch, watch this. Now he's forgiven them. Watch the very next breath. Watch this. For God sent me before you to preserve life. In other words, the adver adversity that they went through became the blessing that preserved life. All because he had the courage in the midst of adversity to stand up for the things of God. Is anybody listening today? We're talking about what adversity teaches. Number one, obedience. Number two, courage. Here's my last one, value. It isn't until a man loses his family that he realizes the importance of his family. It isn't until we lose something in the midst of adversity that we really realize the importance of it and how sad that is. America is experiencing that right now. We're in the midst of adversity because we have never taken the courage to stand up for the things of God. There's this guy by the name of Paul the Apostle. He's amazing to me. He used to be named Saul of Tarsus. He was a very rich young man, head of a synagogue of Tarsus. He was a head pastor of the church at Tarsus, the synagogue. He was educated highly by the very wealthy people in Israel about Judaism. He was a father was a Roman soldier, his mother was a Jew. He was very powerful and very strong and upcoming and had a lot of celebrity status, Paul had. And all of a sudden, he meets up with Jesus on the road to Damascus as he's going there specifically to persecute Christians and God meets him on that road. You talk about adversity. God blinds him and says, you're gonna do something great with me. He gives his heart to God because he has the courage to do that in the midst of adversity. At the end of his life, he writes these words in Philippians the third chapter, we're talking about value. Verse number seven, just pop it up on the overhead. He says, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. In other words, real value is the stuff the world isn't important at all. My education, my financial background, my money, my finances, my celebrity status, nothing's important to me. The real value is my relationship with Jesus Christ. Verse number eight comes in. Yet indeed I also count all things as loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. The word rubbish means poop. Translated in San Bernardino language, it means biodegradable, or we would call it poop. And if we weren't in church, we'd call it something else. <laughs> I count them as poop that I may gain Christ. Next verse. And to be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but which is a, through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God in faith. Verse number 10, listen to this that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and be conformed to his death. In other words, the most important thing in my life is my relationship with God. I have now got real value. It's not the stuff of this world. It's my relationship with God. 
Doesn't mean you can't have the stuff. The stuff just can't have you. Are you following me? Three things today. Obedience. Courage. Values. Here's a question. I'll close with this question to you personally. What do you do when adversity hits? It has hit already numerous times in your life and will hit numerous more times. What you do determines your future. Do you cuss and swear? Do you hate it and are frustrated? Do you cry, bawl, and squall? Do you question God? Do you curse God when adversity hits? Not too long ago, the first part of this year, Debbie and I were away for a couple of days and got a phone call from Pastor Dan, two o'clock in the morning. He said, are you at the house? I said, no. He said, there's a fire alarm going off in your house. Security from the rock is on their way over there and so is the fire department. I said, Dan, let me know as soon as you can what's going on. He said, I will. Half an hour later, he called me back. He said, they've all arrived. It wasn't a fire. It was a flood. On the third floor of the house, a pipe had broken. It had flooded for hours and hours and hours at full force. They say equivalent to one swimming pool dumped in the house. All of the ceilings came down. All of the walls came off down to the studs. The floors that were oak were ruined. The lampshades and lights were ruined. The wallpaper and paneling was gone. It was eliminated from the top floor to the middle floor to the bottom floor, which was a swimming pool. We got home and drove home that night to look at what was taking place. And Deborah said these words to me. Something good is going to come of this. And can I tell you something? How many people look at something bad and answer something good is going to come of this? Can I say this 10 months later? Something good came of that. I'm telling you, it's the way it is. For every one of us that are in here, adversity will be your teacher or it will be your destroyer. Depending on how you answer that one question, when adversity comes, what do you say? Something good is going to come because God will meet all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. All things work together for the good of them that love the Lord or called according to his purpose. I don't know the outcome, but I know my God. Why do I need to know the outcome when I know my God? Are you following me? It gives you the obedience to be the word, do the word, the courage to do the word, and placing a value on the word. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Listen, I want to make sure that you're all all right with God before you go. you got to hear me just for a moment. You don't get to heaven because you're cute and go to this church. You don't get to heaven because you're nice. You don't get to heaven because you're a good person. You don't get to heaven because you hope you're going to make it. You don't get to heaven because... You say you love God. You don't get to heaven because you go to church once in a while. You go to heaven because you're born again. Born again means you've given God all of your heart and given God all of your life. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. There is a bunch of you in here today. You have not given God, hear me, you have not given God Hear me. You know who God is. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year, but you have not given God all of your heart and all of your life. He's just something in your life, like everything else. And today is your day of salvation to change that. 
you're going to have to give God because he won't steal your heart and life from you. He's not a thief. He's not a conniver to manipulate you, make you do this. It's you realizing you have not given God. Oh, you know who he is or you wouldn't be here. But you haven't given him all of your heart. You haven't given him all of your life. Hear me. You know who he is, but you haven't given him all of your heart and you haven't given him all of your life. You call yourself a Christian, but you're not. You're lukewarm. And Jesus said in the book of Revelation, I will vomit you from my mouth. You better be hot or cold because if you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. In other words, you're not going to make it when Jesus comes back. Lukewarm is a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God. No, no, you're not against him, but you're not wholehearted for him. And you haven't given God all of your heart, and you haven't given God all of your life. And today, this is a divine appointment for you to give God all of your heart. Today is your divine appointment with God to give him all of your life. Bottom line, you're going to have to do it. I can't do it for you. And you don't get brownie points with God because you come to church. You come to church, you get edified, strengthened, encouraged, and directed. But you don't get brownie points. Somebody needs to tell you. Today, you need to give God all of your heart. Today, you need to give God all of your life. And you need to stop messing with God and I'm going to tell you right now to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. Get a friend if you need one. If you're sitting next to someone, just say, come on, I'll go with you. And I want you to get your stuff, get out of your seat, and meet me right here. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. That's a hard thing for me to do. Yep, it takes courage. But listen to what I'm going to say to you. Jesus, it took courage for him to go to that cross, a beaten, bloody mess for you. You can get out of your seat in a safe, friendly church, get in the aisle and meet me right here in front and give him all of your heart, give him all of your life. Listen, if you're in the foyer and you're hearing me right now and you know it's your time, tell an usher you need to come in. If you're in the family rooms and you need to come, get your stuff, get your kids, get down here. I'm waiting for you right now. You get out of your seat. Let's all stand as the people come. You come right now. Come on. Come on. Don't clap. Don't clap. Don't clap. I just want you to come. Just come. If you need to come, this is the time. Come on, they're coming all over the place. They're coming from all over. You can come too. You get out of your seat and get down here. Give God your heart. Get born again. Get alive for Christ. Come on. Come on. There's more of you than that. A lot more of you. Stop messing with God and get down here. You're going to die and go to hell if you don't get out of your seat and come now. You're going to die and go to hell if you don't get out of your seat and come now and stop screwing around with God. You've screwed around long enough and somebody needs to be in your face to tell you the truth. Your life is at stake. Come on. Come on home. This is the time. Come on. Come on. You've made enough excuses. Use some courage and get down here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't wait for the person next to you. Just say, excuse me. You're not going to spill their popcorn. We're not in a the movie theater. Get it right by them and get down here. Come on. Who cares if anybody else goes? You're going to stand before God alone. I'm telling you, you wanted someone to tell you like it is or do you want someone to, you know, blow smoke all over you in incense? Today is your day of salvation. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Slap yourself in the face if you're saying to yourself and argue with yourself right now. Say, well, I don't think I want to do that. It'll embarrass me. Sure, it'll embarrass you. You'll be a whole lot more embarrassed when you get into hell. Then you'll do anything and everything to get out of hell, and it's too late. 
and somebody loves you enough to be in your face to tell you about this is what you ought to be doing right now. Somebody cares. Somebody is being a man of God at the judgment of a lot of people right now because I do things differently than anybody else but I'm at least telling you the truth and you need to get right with God and you've been waiting for someone to stop playing games and tell you like it is, this is the time to come. All of you in front, thank God you've come. I want you to look to your left. See this guy over here, his name is Pastor Dave. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. Thank God you've come. Thank God you've come. And he'll tell you what's next after that. Just make a left turn, follow Pastor Dave right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.